some people like to think that the deep web is a joke. It's not. In no way is it a place some half-assed show-off should even think about stumbling into. In fact, I would tell even the most seasoned of hackers with any fiber of a moral compass to stay the fuck away from that place. Because it's a place that will scar you and leave you terrified to follow the cyber footprints left by someone else's shadow ever again. I know this because I'm a hacker. Or, at least I used to be one. I had been using computers since I was 12 years old. I had always been fascinated with the idea of being a cyber crusader, determined to find the new uncharted territories of the internet. I'd gotten pretty good at utilizing bits of software here and there, and it even got to the point where the slow crawl of dial-up internet didn't even affect me anymore. Especially when you knew what processes you wanted active and which ones you could afford to kill to increase the crawl rate of your PC. In other words, I had a pretty good idea of what I was doing. By the time I was 20 years old, I could both safely and confidently call myself an ace when it came to hacking. I could keep up with the best and had made a name for myself among many other netizens on the web. In fact, I was among the few thousands who had managed to come up with the formula to hack the Google search bar in order to delve deeper into the directories to get what we wanted. Call it our own personal attack for having bought the rights for YouTube and slapping content creators with copyright infringements left and right. The early years of YouTube back then were not pretty. I had my channel taken down several times because of Google's little purchase. But that's neither here nor there. This plays no bearing on the story. I'm simply giving you a little history lesson, especially for all the younger netizens out there. Anyone who was a hacker knew about the deep web. It pretty much had the same purpose as most would speculate it does today. Drugs, guns, illegal imports, you name it and that place pretty much had it. The deep web was, and is, the gateway into what is known as the global black market. I had purchased a few imported goods during that time and had a decent amount of drugs. It was about halfway through the first semester at my school. Sophomore year of college was my time to be stoned almost constantly, so I was a regular customer on the digital black market. Most of my friends came to me for the hookup, and I could always cut them a pretty good deal based on my frequent interactions with sellers on the net. To access the deep web, you didn't have things like Tor browsers, not back then. To access the darker side of the web, you needed to know what you were doing. Ghost hacking, proxies, parent directories, backdoors, scramblers, dump sites. These are all terms hackers utilized years back and when Java was not as prevalent in browsers as they are today. Back in the day, it was often referred to as the dark net. I don't know when it transitioned into the deep web and I don't really care. I'm never going back. I had just gotten some new equipment for my computer, the CRT I had been using finally quit and after ordering a new monitor and some more RAM I was pretty set to go. My plan was to try and barter for a better sound card when I could afford it with the vendors I went to on the dark net. I was setting up to do a little bit of gaming when I noticed I had an alert from one of my net friends saying they had stumbled across something interesting. A series of black boxes that when opened, seemed to lead you down another web directory. It was like tunneling, but more vast. Knowing my curious nature, he had passed the information on to me, knowing I would want to follow up on this information. I was one of the few vagrant hackers in my circle, an explorer, mindlessly taking one path and then another and opening up a door and seeing where it goes. Most times you would come across a treasure trove of information, or a dead end. He hadn't cut any corners when he broke down everything to me. His start point, the different pathways he had taken, how often he had reset his IP address per 30 to 45 seconds, what protocols he had used to cover up his trail, and the level of encryption that he had encountered with each box and how long it had taken him to reach the next one. Seven boxes he had come across, and upon reaching the seventh is where he'd gotten stuck. Challenge accepted. I quickly glanced over the data, already booting up the ghost hacks and IP scramblers. I needed to have what was in front of me knocked out of the way as well as being able to cover my own ass. With the new encryption I had made, I would be able to latch onto an existing IP address for 30 seconds before bouncing to another one, making it seem like I had disappeared. 
This was great in theory, but forced my movements to be slow when it came to being able to do things on my sad little Inspiron. In ten short minutes, I was ready to go. Like he had shown me, I followed his pathways and activated my encryptions to keep myself safe, wandering from parent directory to parent directory. It didn't take long for me to run into the first black box. Just a basic encryption that took almost no time to break through. Inside was a directory with four different subdirectories. I knew that the second link was where my friend went, but my curiosity led me to pick the first one. In about three minutes, I realized it was a dead end, so I quickly backtracked and made my way to the main directory, deciding that I wouldn't deviate from his original path. In about half an hour, I ran through all six black boxes, coming across the seventh and realized that the encryption on this particular box was very different. Every hacker, no matter how good, leaves a sliver of information behind. You just have to know what to look for. I knew my friend had been here and this is where he had gotten stuck. This was a unique lock, one that I knew would take a bit of time to break through the encryption. It was a Thursday night, I'd finished up my work early for a change and I wasn't called into work so I had time to kill. Now this box was a tricky little shit. I had never run across so many tedious things to break through in my entire life. It was more annoying than an actual challenge. A tug here, a pull there, slipping and dipping and moving around all the different codes in an attempt to decipher just what all this information entailed. But I wasn't allowed the luxury of lingering because the minute I got distracted to see and understand what exactly I was swimming through, the encryption would completely kick me out of the box, forcing me to start all over again. After another 45 minutes, I managed to break through and I felt like I was sitting on top of the world, but the only problem was that I was in another directory again. Except this time, there was only one thing inside of it. It was a redirect hyperlink labeled WTTMH. I was too happy to know I'd broken through the damn encryption code blocking this pathway that I didn't even stop to think and wonder what those letters meant. Like a fucking pleb, I just clicked on the link and let it redirect me. My ghost was active, so I wasn't worried about being traced. It did its thing, redirecting me to another website. This site took a little bit longer to load. Possibly because my ghost was attempting to filter and tunnel through anything that would have pinged me on someone's radar. This was also an indication that I had entered through a back door. One that I really didn't have any business utilizing, but I did anyway. When messing around in the darknet, you only ever use the back entrance onto pages if you thought you were the shit and didn't think you'd get caught. That or you were the site manager themselves. About five minutes later, the webpage finally loaded up. Soft, creepy carnival music played in the background, barely above the sound of a whisper. Even with headphones on, I had to really pay attention to take notice of it. Across the window, in big, bold letters, read, Welcome to the Monkey House. I was immediately intrigued. Being the huge Kurt Vonnegut fan that I am, I recognized the title for what it was. But for anyone who has read the compilation of short stories, I assumed I was about to walk into a place full of rebels, preaching on their soapboxes like they were Harrison Bergerin. I wished that had been the case. I wished it more than anything, now that I think back on it. A window popped up on the bottom right of the browser, a chat window and a greeting message. I'll never forget the way my heart almost shrank in on itself in response to that gray box. It read, Welcome to the monkey house, home of all the chills and thrills you can imagine and some even beyond your wildest dreams. Would you like a guided tour? Despite my interest, I didn't want to linger around in this place. The host was most likely surveying the area and monitoring all traffic flow spilling onto the site. Hell, the site owner could have very well been the one pinging that automated message to me right that second. No thank you, I wrote. If you insist, do you already know your way around the monkey house then? I don't think I've seen you around here before. No, I was referred by a friend. I couldn't believe I just straight up lied like that. But I had panicked. Something told me that this wasn't some bot. 
I was talking to a real person and I already knew I was a lot further in the dark net than I normally wandered into. They could eat me alive if I gave them a single reason to get suspicious of me. Their response. Oh, you mean for the event this evening? We had given guest vouchers to all of our VIP members so they could invite their friends to tonight's special event. Event? What the fuck? There was an event? I decided I would just play along so as not to give myself away. I had clearly come across a membership-only site, waltzing in through the back door like I own the place. Yeah, that's it. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I don't know my way around and I don't see any guide links telling me where I need to go or even where I can go. Well, you wouldn't be able to see any of that with a guest voucher anyway. The Monkey House is membership only and the only way in is either through a voucher or an actual invitation. This explains why I didn't recognize your IP address. My heart dropped into my stomach. Oh shit, he could see my IP. Which meant that if I didn't turn off my piggyback code, they would see my IP change right before their eyes. Panicking, I quickly pulled up my command prompt window and stopped my ghost from scrambling my IP and latching onto another person's as they passed within my latch zone. I stared at my now static IP address, listing that I was from Turkey. I see. Well, the event will be starting soon, just follow this link when you're ready. Chatting is free, but the picture quality will be reduced to SD resolution since you're just a guest. HD is for members only. I understand. Basic etiquette applies. You will receive one warning and then afterwards you will be banned. You are free to leave before the event has concluded, but your IP will be permanently blocked from regaining entry unless you are able to get a personal invitation to return back to the monkey house. Your IP has been logged for future reference so that we may extend the invitation to you in the future. We will not be held responsible for any physical, emotional, or psychological trauma that you may incur due to attending the event. Do you understand the rules? I was so fucked. <sighs> yes, I understand. Excellent. Well, as previously stated, just click on that link that I provided and it will take you directly to where the event is being taken place. Thank you for coming and enjoy the show. The window disappeared off my screen and all I could do was stare at the website. The dark carnival music continuing to play softly in the background. A ticker flashed across the top of my screen announcing that the event would be taking place in just a few short minutes. I suspected that I was still being monitored so I clicked on a link and it redirected me to another page where a graphic of a stage and velvet red curtains were drawn ambient sounds that you would normally hear in a theater. The hushed whisperings of the audience, shuffling of programs, and even a person coughing every so often could be heard. I was impressed. They'd certainly gone all out for this thing, whatever it was. When it got to about 10 minutes till the launch, another window popped up on my screen. This time larger than the first and different screen names began to pop up inside as people came into the room. It was clearly a group chat window, the one that would allow all of us to talk to each other while the show began. Some people immediately passed off greetings as though they were being reunited with old buddies for the game and knocking back a beer. I hadn't chosen a screen name yet remaining as the default anonymous 10235 or whatever the fucking number was at the end of it. A soft piano sound rang out and we watched the animated curtains part and behind it was a video screen, more than likely connected to some live feed. The camera was off and the transmission was offline as stated in the top right corner of the window. People's excitement was clear in the chat and they all discussed what the event would be about. It must have been an understood rule not to talk in detail about what had been previously showcased in another session, as no one dared to drop hints or blatantly speak about what they had seen before. This was crazy. I was scared before I had even really did anything. Nothing was happening and I felt extremely on edge. That should have been my first sign that I needed to get the hell out of there. But I still hadn't said anything. Someone took note that I hadn't either. Hey, you think Anon went AFK? 
I went wide-eyed at the screen. Don't know. Yo, Anon, where are you at? Say something, creeping ass motherfucker. A chill ran down my back, slow and unsettling before I let my fingers fly across the keys. The first was to change my screen name. Waki Blaster. It was a desperate attempt to combine two aliases I'd previously been known for into one thing. My mind switched back into hacker mode and I cleared my throat some, still mentally bracing myself for what was about to happen. I'll say something when I've got something to say, which won't be much seeing as how the show's getting ready to start. A few oohs and oh snap in response. I wasn't about to get an ego over some smart ass comment, not when I was in unknown territory like this. In hindsight, I should have just left. I should have just said fuck this place and dipped out of there. But I was too afraid of giving myself away, especially now that I had bothered to open my stupid mouth. A hailstorm of messages flooded the chat, mostly people counting down the seconds as we hit the one minute mark. A time ticker appeared over the video window mounted on the stage when it hit 30 seconds. They went from white to pink and then a shade of red growing darker as the numbers decreased slowly to one. Zero was completely blood red and then disappeared from the screen as static appeared in the video frame. The show was about to begin. A person with a mask appeared on the screen. The mask, a stark porcelain white with a pair of painted blue eyes and a black twisted smirk spreading across the lower portion of it. Their wild, matted hair stuck out around the edges of the mask, the rest hidden by a silk top hat. He was dressed to the nines, a deep red and black three-piece suit and half cape draped over one of his shoulders. He held a long, black cane with a silver skull atop the handle as the decorative piece. Good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. For all returning members, it is so very good to see you again. As for all the newcomers, I welcome you to the Monkey House. I'm your host, Hans Twilight, the ringleader of this humble little carnival of mine. I couldn't help but laugh a little, feeling some of my anxiety wash away. <laughs> what the fuck was I watching? I had been so worried about a sideshow freak like this. Jovial music played in the background of the video and I leaned back in my chair, silently fussing at myself for having gotten so worked up over nothing. We have a very special treat in store for all of you this evening. Are you ready for this little show of ours to begin? The chat room was soon flooded with messages confirming that they were, in fact, ready. Hans appeared to be looking off to the right where the window was and he let out a chuckle. Rolling the cane between both of his leather gloved hands, he leaned towards the camera a bit more and tilted his head to the side. Very well, let the show begin! He stepped away from the screen, giving out a wide flourishing gesture with his cane as he pointed the tip to an area behind him. It was too dark to see anything until an overhead light came on, illuminating a man strapped to a table who was wearing an elephant mask. He struggled against the leather straps binding him just as a buzzsaw roared to life at the space between his legs by his ankles. There was applause being heard in the video. Something I had assumed, and hoped, was just an audio track that was playing in response. The chat was going crazy with excitement as my heart sank into the pit of my stomach, the realization of what was happening hitting me. I immediately covered my mouth with my hands. Oh my god. Starting out the night, we have Ringo, ladies and gentlemen. You all casted your votes last week and we held a little competition to see who this week's winning executioner would be. Trixie Mir 571 you are this week's winner and get to choose how each of our three attractions get to die. Your entry, Death by Table Saw, is what helped you win the competition, so here it is. I watched as that very screen name began to type out her gleeful screams and everyone else congratulated her. All except me. Did no one care about the muffled screams of the man strapped to the fucking table saw? What the fuck is wrong with these people? I was sitting there literally watching as Trixie typed more stuff into the chat window. I wanted to tell myself that this wasn't real, that this couldn't be real, but as Trixie typed out that she wanted the man to be slowly inched forward towards the saw, it became horrifically clear that this was in fact real. 
two men unstrapped his restraints and the elephant man immediately began fighting against them. Sadly, the other guys were bigger and stronger than him, each grasping for his respective wrists and ankles. His screams began to elevate as his legs were spread and arms held straight up above him. The sound of blades cutting into human flesh is no different than the sound of a butcher carving into a hunk of meat. The hum of the buzzsaw escalated as soon as it made contact and the spray of blood that followed made me turn my head and cover my mouth. Elephant Man's screams were now a high-pitched squeal and had I not been so afraid of vomiting, I would have used both of my hands to cover my ears. So I was greeted by the sounds of death while closing my eyes. I couldn't watch, I just, I just couldn't, but the sound of meat being sawed through, the cracking of bones and the spray of blood intermingled with the horrible sounds of his screams would be forever burned into my mind. I ignored these sick bastards in the chat room because they were clearly all getting their fucking rocks off on this shit. During my time moving around in the dark net, I had heard rumors about stuff like this. These twisted shows with nothing but horrible people and guaranteed deaths for their victims. Each member paid monthly dues or some other bullshit and the worst part was that the general public wanted more. They paid to watch people get tortured and killed and then cast aside without much of a care in the world. It was fucking murder. It felt forever before only silence remained in that place. That fucking audience applause track played again along with the dark carnival music. It wasn't until I opened my eyes to look back at my computer screen that I realized I had been crying. Never in my 20 years of life had I ever experienced anything so fucking messed up. I was that young person who had grown up believing in the good in everyone, that all people deserved a second chance. Not these guys. They all needed to be dumped off in a nuclear waste zone and left there to fend for themselves. Every single one of them. But I couldn't call them out on it. I couldn't threaten to tell the cops either. It would have been nothing for one of those guys on his team or even the actual site host to look at my static IP and realize I was actually piggybacking off of someone else. And without a way to escape, they'd zero in on my true IP address and quite possibly hunt me down. Actually, no. Scratch that. They would hunt me down. I tried to exit out of the browser just to pull myself out of that nightmare. My browser wouldn't close, not even hard killing it through the task manager did anything. Some kind of script on the site was preventing me, and everyone else, from being able to close the browser. We were locked in. We couldn't get out. I couldn't get out. Well that was certainly colorful, wasn't it? Let's have Bridget come out now. The next victim was brought out. A young woman wearing a tiger mask. She was sitting in a clawfoot bathtub filled with water, a live battery and jumper cable situated on a table nearby. No, 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 fuck! I didn't care anymore, I couldn't watch another second of this. I activated my command prompt, I was going to kill these scripts one at a time if I needed to. I just needed to make enough of a hole for me to wiggle out of. Just enough to get myself out and have it seal itself shut behind me. Since I assumed I was the only one trying to get out, then a couple of scripts dying here and there wouldn't bring me any unwanted attention. The very second I killed one script, a separate chat window popped up onto my screen. I've been waiting on you to make your move. My mouth went dry almost instantly, my hands frozen as they hovered above the keyboard. No, they couldn't have noticed that, it was just some basic insignificant code that wouldn't have affected any of the scripts on the current page. It was just some silent background coding. I decided to play dumb. What are you talking about? You think I don't recognize a fucking ghost hacker when I see one? God fucking damn it. I had been so careless I knew I had. I should have never let my curiosity get the better of me. I'll give you some credit though. I know you're not in Turkey, but you're doing a fan-fucking-tastic job of misdirecting me from your real one. Now I was scared. I was fucking terrified. This person was trying to put a crack in the only shield of protection I had in this place. If I had known this was going to happen, I wouldn't have bothered making my IP static in the first place. My misdirection sequence would only be successful for so long before it finally lost its effect and I would be discovered. This was my first time running across another hacker with malicious intent against me. I didn't know what I would expect or what would come of me the moment I was caught, but I didn't care anymore. 
Without blinking, I reached behind my rig and pulled the power supply cord loose from the machine. My screen went dark and the carnival music was no more. I didn't waste another second. Getting my tools out, I started dismantling my tower, all but ripping parts out of the machine before dumping memory sticks and various other components into the bathroom sink. I flooded them in the basin without a second thought, returning to my room and grabbing a handful of refrigerator magnets and started running them across everything that had been inside my rig. My roommate walked in just as I was stripping the shell of my rig to the bare minimum and when she asked what I was doing, I told her that it was in her best interest to not pry about it. Not that I would have told her anyway. It's safe to assume I tore the ever-living shit out of my machine. It's also safe to assume that for the next six months, I didn't go anywhere near a computer that wasn't part of campus property and outside of my school email, I erased all of my previous emails and messenger names, even the ones dating back as far as middle school. I did everything I could to erase my very existence off the internet world for a time and stop being a hacker altogether. I hadn't even let any of my contacts know I was going off the grid on the net. Maybe it was better for them not to know. I never did tell my friend that I managed to break through that last black box. I still haven't, even after all these years. I don't know if that place is still running or not, or if after eight years, the person in charge finally just had enough and threw it all away. To tell you the truth, I don't want to know either. I took one thing from that experience and made one wish, that for the rest of my life, I never see a message addressed to me saying, Welcome to the Monkey House. Look, in order to give context to this, let me, let me explain who I am and why the fuck I'm bothering sharing this information. I'm a 22 year old male, just finished my masters at university. I was about 12 when I was given permission to start using my dad's spare laptop, since his work gave him a new one every couple of years and he thought I could use the experience of getting used to tech early on. When I got into high school, I got word from a group of stoners that people were accessing restricted parts of the internet, which held everyone's information. I went ahead and did some more digging online and found out about the dark web, finding proxy sites as well as hacks that you could use via command prompts to mask your IP address and basically walk through a lot of locked doors. I spent the better part of my late teens doing this kind of stuff online using a few online forums like Raddot to talk with people who were basically doing the same shit as me. I didn't really have many friends offline, so yeah, online was the place for me and I got pretty good at blending in. I had three aliases which I used, but only a close online friend of mine knew that they were all me. Nathan was my main link to the dark web, since he somehow spent more time on it than I did, even when the only thing I did other than ghosting with him was playing Halo with him on my friends list. What I liked about him is that neither of us mentioned our last names, or any real information, even though we both could have looked it up at any time and found pretty much whatever we wanted about the other person. That being said, I trusted Nathan more than almost anyone, and he knows more about this story than even I'd be willing to admit on here. During uni, I roomed with a local dealer who, unknown to the education board that expelled him, he worked for me. 
It was pretty fucking easy to order narcotics online, like MDMA and X, if you knew where to look. I even had them shipped to my dorm room's local P.O. box at one time, without anyone being any the fucking wiser. I'd get the drugs online. My former friend would then use his real-life connections to sell them, since I didn't really have any of my own. This was around the time that I felt like I had all the cards and no one could touch me, if they couldn't track my IP, that is. I was in the second year of my biomed course when I got into the stupid shit. Scumbag pieces of shit would be sharing snuff videos online that would make even the most messed up pornography you've laid eyes upon look like fucking white bread. This is why I only use links that I either found myself or, more often, the ones that Nathan gave me. We would spend days, literally days, just marveling at all the crazy shit which people could get away with. Yeah, the government had shut down the main sites like Silk Road and Mad Onion, but those are like the only ones that idiots online seem to ever take notice of. Other hackers would message me on forums, asking for sites to get weed and other drugs from, which was as simple as pointing in a fucking direction, really. The university claimed to monitor internet traffic to stop people from doing freaky shit online after they heard people were hacking student accounts and ruining online schedules, but I guarantee you that they did absolutely nothing to the people who were actually doing it. I'm not confessing to having done these acts, I just know exactly which individuals did. By third year, I had made enough money to have a long screen setup of my own which made decrypting site details a lot quicker for me, and I actually had gotten pretty good at it. I... I had been delving around some messed up sites, and to be honest, I would even talked in chat rooms to some of the admins in charge of them. You'd probably be surprised how normal a child pornography site owner would seem if you didn't know that he also had a day job. I got more curious though. Fucking stupid of me, I know. After nearly 10 years of seamlessly making my way around the dark web, I joined Nathan as well as a few others in a chat room just fucking about and sharing some screwed up sites. It might sound weird, but for me, it's a pretty everyday thing to do. Nathan and another friend were talking about some site that no one had managed to get past the encryption to, apart from one other person who's even more of a no-life than me. The rest of us are pretty sure he's autistic or some shit, because the site he shared with us was arguably the most vile thing I've ever laid eyes upon. This site is the most cancerous and revolting sector from the darkest part of the dark web. It's a scar that I bear to this day, and it's... It's one that I'll never, ever forget. I I want to warn everyone again that this is not for the faint-hearted, and something that even the most emotionally numb people will not be able to deal with. I won't share the site URL since I don't want this video taken down, nor do I want anyone even giving it the slightest bit of publicity aside from what I have to say here. That being said, it did have a subheading in HTML that I'll leave other people like me to have a look at if they want to. Most people referred to it as cold body. The autistic dude who was in the chat room earlier gave Nathan and I an encrypted URL, but he was too fucking giddy about getting through to the site himself to send us an encryption, so Nathan and I had to manually go through the whole process ourselves. Nathan and I had been doing this for pretty much the entirety of our adult lives, yet We'd never seen code like this before. Come to think of it, I doubt that the other guy in the chat cracked this by himself. Nathan and I both called it a night, so I left the command prompt open and went outside to smoke a joint. Nathan remained on chat so that we could play Anvil, a Russian crack of Halo for PC. But when I got back, his microphone was muted for some reason. For people like us who had nothing to hide from each other, we almost never muted our mics. I wait a few minutes thinking maybe he's jacking off or maybe gone to get something, but nothing. I sat down and took another look through the code, thinking that there was something I missed. I did. The code was 
completely different, completely unencrypted. I simply launched the URL in my PC Word for a while until finally opening up about 20 windows across my two monitors, all of them scrambling code through a debugger that I had installed. Even with 32 gigabytes of RAM, my computer was making more noise than it ever did doing this kind of stuff. I thought to myself, shit, I'm going to have to OC my shit in the BIOS if I'm even going to have a shot at getting through. And I was not feeling up for it after smoking too much. I get ready to hard reset before my monitors turn off and back on, one at a time. This was when I started getting a bit paranoid, and I was thinking about just letting it go. I fucking wish that was what I did. The windows were almost all gone. Only four were still there, and two of them were normal deep websites that the admin probably used to relay the IP address through. That was the first site I'd seen do that. All of the text was dark red and extremely oh. primitive for a site that I thought would be at least a little bit more impressive considering its security. The main center window had only a small amount of text on the screen. It read, If you've made it this far, you know what you're in for. If you still don't, you don't belong here. Even though I was feeling mellow, the text and sheer awe of what I was getting myself into pierced me with fear. A simple yes-no prompt popped up in the window. I... I accepted, ready for whatever awaited me on the other side. A chat room window came to life in the second remaining window. I was wondering what it was for. Perhaps another IP relay or a shadow app that hit the true nature of the site behind it. It simply stated, insert name, as well as an optional password that I'm still not sure what was for. The fact that people might have accounts to this kind of site, looking back on it, it's fucked up. A couple more scrolls of red text flew up the window, and then it opened up into an actual sort of chat room like you'd see in Omegle or some shit, except with no ads or color or anything besides the dark red text. The chat was a bit more advanced than the first window, which was now frozen and wasn't responding to any console commands I was using on it. I have to say, the feeling of finding the site in the first place, it felt pretty awesome. I couldn't wait to tell Nathan. That was, until the chat window popped up with names. One that I recognized was his, using one of his aliases as well. I'd say about three dozen people were in the chat room. No names that I can remember though, and even if I did, I wouldn't dare reveal them. Not after this. I tried calling Nathan on my phone, but he wasn't picking up. We were so fucked. It was stupid of us to delve in this deep without even knowing what we were getting ourselves into. The users had definitely met before, as they immediately started posting messages to the window as myself and Nathan remained silent. As they were casually talking about stuff, I was starting to calm down a bit. Maybe this was just a stupid exclusive cult website that talked about organizing deals or other dumb shit that I'd found in the past. It all seemed so normal. So why all the obscurity? The first window, still blank and unresponsive, suddenly began loading up a video file of some sort. A snuff video, perhaps? It would make sense to hide one, but not this extensively, and the chat room didn't make much sense either. I wish that this stuff had been going through my head at the time, if I wasn't retarded enough to get stoned before going through with this shit. I felt tempted to ask the other users what the video was about, but I was afraid that might give me away as someone who's not supposed to be there. Nathan hadn't said anything either, so I wasn't going to risk doing something suspicious like that. I got the guts to ask, what are we all here for then, you cunts? Trying to sound as eccentric and dim-witted as I could. I, I didn't get a response from them. As a matter of fact, no one said another word. Nathan stayed quiet, but I assumed that he noticed me in the chat as well now that I'd posted. The video had stopped loading, 
and had begun playing. Some more messages from the other users sharing their anticipation as footage of a dark grey basement somewhere took shape on the screen. The resolution for the video was pretty awful at first, but rendered pretty well after about 30 seconds. I... I was scared shitless. No one else was in the house that I share with my roommates. Most had left for the summer vacation and I didn't head home for another two weeks. I was alone in the dark with little else but the ambient sound of whatever was happening behind the camera in the video. It stays like this for about four or five minutes. I spent every second of it staring at the screen, waiting for something to happen. Finally, a dude steps onto the screen holding up a whiteboard with foreign letters on it as well as the words cold body underneath. The guy was fucking ominous to look at, pretty overweight and what could only be described as a motorbiker's beard. The man spoke. I had no idea what he was saying at first. He was speaking in Chinese I think, but I don't really know, I'm not a fucking linguist. Luckily for Nathan and I, the man had another person beside him who spoke some broken English. Hello users, welcome Cold Body Show. I was honestly more interested than scared at this point. This video looked like it could be something worth showing to the others. That thought never crossed my mind again. The man with the broken English burst into tears and sobs out of nowhere. He sobs in front of the camera and jerks around in what I can only guess was desperation. The man holding the sign yells at the guy in Chinese before another man enters the frame and puts a gun to his head. Before I could even realize that it was a gun, the man fired. And he didn't stop there. Pressing the barrel of the gun against the dead man's temple, he fired again and again. Each shot spraying blood and what I guess were pieces of the man's skull all over the place. That was when I stared at the chat window again. The users were talking about what they should do next. The users were all typing in different languages, but almost all of the English ones that I read said, shoot him again. I realized then that I wasn't watching some shock video or stupid snuff film that the admins had hid behind a wall of proxies. This, this was a live stream. I was watching a live stream of people being murdered in front of me. We all were. I typed into the chat, you sick fucks, and what the fuck are you guys doing? But the texts weren't responded to because so many people were spamming the chat with forum text I couldn't read. Another person is brought out in front of the camera, this time already sobbing and trying to break free of the ropes that had been bound around her ankles and wrists. She was bare naked and covered in bruises and cuts. I didn't do anything but wait for the inevitable. The man shot her in the head and watched her body fall limp on the floor. People in the chat cheered and asked for more. Someone picks up the camera and positions it in a different direction towards a metal table covered with some sort of bin liner. The woman's body was dragged by the hair into frame and placed on the table. What happened next? I don't think the world should know. I'm not kidding. This is your final warning. The body was slumped on the table like a surgeon would do before operating on a person. Some more people Wearing red and black ski masks, they went up to the body holding items varying from kitchen knives to cordless drills. I couldn't watch without feeling physically sick to my stomach. The men tore her apart limb from limb, stabbing at her torso and cutting her open. I take another glance to see one of the men was having sex with the mutilated corpse. I almost immediately retch and almost vomit over my keyboard, but I gain control of myself before that happens. My heart was beating like crazy. This whole situation was so fucked. And I was... I was weighing over my fucking head here. By the time the men were finished, there was literally a stump of a human being left. Not that you could fucking call that human anymore. Her head was literally torn off the neck and stuffed into a body cavity, along with one of her arms. 
Three more people were brought onto the screen, all of them screaming for their lives and trying to escape. One of them is shot in the leg. The others stand there, shaking in place, trying not to scream again. The man holding the sign walks up to the lens of the camera and stares into it. I see his black eyes and blood splattered across his face. I breathe faster and I actually had to look away. It was like he was staring right at me. He says something else in a foreign language, probably the same one as before. When he stops speaking, the chat window does the same. Hardly another single post. Just a chat window awaiting some response. About 20 seconds passes of him just staring into the camera after speaking. Nothing happens at first. The chat then mentioned me and Nathan by our usernames. More of them spam our names in posts that take over the scrolling message board. As soon as they mentioned our aliases, I started freaking out. I try to close the black windows, but every time that I try, the window says that the application isn't responding. The live stream continues, the man staring at me and the message prompting me to say something. One of the few comments in proper English pops up. He's asking us to choose which one to kill first. I freeze for about five seconds before unplugging my computer from the wall. I didn't care about anything anymore. I just wanted to leave the site and never come back. I sat there with a blank screen in front of me for a bit before pacing around the kitchen. I was done with it. I didn't sleep at all. I was just too traumatized to even think about resting after what I had just seen. At the time of this happening, I was thinking about reporting the site to the police, but I of all people know that they can't do anything to stop this. To think that more of these sites could exist, that more people are getting gunned down and mutilated for entertainment, it's something that I can't fucking think about. Fuck. I spent two days talking to some close friends about this, though I left out all the details and just said that I'd seen something disturbing online. They, they all know what I do in my free time, so they didn't think much of it since I'd mentioned snuff films and messed up sites before. They didn't know what Nathan and I had seen. I mustered up the courage to turn on my PC again, and I was fucking relieved to see no sign of any viruses, and most of all, no black windows scattered on my desktop. I immediately go check if Nathan had left me any messages on RadDot. I had several messages from him with a few files attached to the second. I was hoping to talk this whole ordeal through with him, but the files immediately caught my eye. The fucking attachments were pictures of me, stolen from my Facebook and email, pictures of my old school, university, and even my friends here. The messages after were my addresses, emails, online aliases, and even the names of my family members. My IP address was posted to the bottom, and I realized how fucked I am. The last picture of me and my old girlfriend, with her IP address and details pasted on top of the picture. There's no fucking way that they tracked me down. I take a few minutes to pull myself together before writing back. What the fuck happened? Who are you? I didn't get a response, and I still haven't to this day. He has all of my details. He knows everything about me and my family, and I don't even know what else. I still don't know what has happened to him since I left that live stream. I can only pray that the information he has doesn't fall into the hands of those murderous insane motherfuckers who killed and desecrated dozens of people on the darkest part of the internet. I can't let them find me or those who I care about. I will never go back to that part of the internet again, ever. It's not fucking safe for me or you or anyone. The police can't find them, but they can find you. Please, don't try and find the site, and don't try and report the site. They will do to you what they did to me, and if you think that they won't find you, then remember that I was fucking invisible.
all assume that you all know about the deep web. Well, uh, what you've heard, it's true. It's not a great place. Uh, while some people are there to score weed or firearms, or even out of sheer curiosity, others, well, they're obviously not up to anything good. But I'm not here to talk about those sickos. I'm here to talk about what lies beyond that point. The more cryptic and unexplained part of the internet. The part that nobody's really supposed to see. There was an infographic that cropped up a while ago. I'm not sure when. The eight levels of the internet. Maybe you've seen it. As interesting as it was, it's complete bunk. I'm sorry, but polymeric derivation, it means nothing. And the Primark system? I guess somebody's a fan of Warhammer. No, there's no quantum mechanics involved here. However, that doesn't mean that it was an easy place to find. Now, I'm not going to begin to tell you how to get here. It's unlikely that you'd be able to, even if I did. I'm not tooting my own horn here. I just didn't have a life outside of this. I was warned, of course. Everybody told me that I wasn't going to like what I saw. That I wouldn't even understand it. And now, I'm passing off that warning to you. Don't try to look for this. There's no official name for this place. Or at least, I haven't seen one. There were rumors, however... These range from an Illuminati chat room to a virtual holding cell for an experimental AI gone rogue. In reality though, it's a lot worse. After a long and painful process of breaking down firewalls, encryptions, solving bizarre philosophical riddles, and following hidden links, I was finally directed to a blank page with one line of text and a text box underneath. It read in Latin, what do you seek? I remember feeling surprised, but in retrospect, I didn't know what I was expecting. I'll admit, I was a bit stumped here, partly because I didn't know the answer to that question. I had no objective. I just wanted to see if I could do it, really. I tried some generic answers at first. I typed in the truth and enlightenment. You know, matrix shit. And nothing happened. I tried a bunch of answers, but none of them worked. I was getting frustrated at this point. Maybe this just was a gag page or something. Maybe I really hadn't figured anything out. If only. I tried something off the wall. I'm not sure how this came to me or why I thought it would even work but I typed in what also seeks me. And now that I think about it, this thing might have been an AI indeed. To my surprise, the page went blank, like fully blank. I waited, and after about five minutes, I was directed to what looked like a forum. No, not even that though. It was more basic, just a list of links over a brownish yellow background. The links themselves were indecipherable. Just seemingly random sequences of characters, symbols and letters. A lot of them I had never seen before. It almost looked like an alien language to be honest. But it was obviously just a code that I didn't understand. At this point, expectations were off the wall. Each link was a shot in the dark. I clicked on the first one. It loaded up a live feed of what seemed to be the Paris catacombs. I watched for a while, but it was ultimately uneventful. I moved on to the next link. It was a shaky video in a dark setting, but I could make out men in tactical gear. They were in a house, opening doors and sweeping each room. Eventually, they kicked one down to reveal a creature, tall and humanoid with scaly skin. It was gnawing on a dismembered arm, 
They tried shooting at it, but it escaped out the window, and the video just stopped there. Well, I was completely floored. I mean, what the hell was this? It looked too real to be unreleased film footage, and I was officially intrigued. Maybe this was worth the months of headaches and bloodshot eyes after all. I couldn't stop now, so I started working down the list of links. With each click, everything got more and more bizarre, more disturbing. I stumbled upon a document called the Paragon Project, detailing trials of human experimentation that would lead to superhuman levels of strength and durability. It was an apparent success, according to the document, and it looked official too. There were essays on space-time anomalies, glitches in reality, and apparent pictures of alternate dimensions. There were detailed explanations regarding Area 51, the Bermuda Triangle, assassinations, disappearances, and the true nature of the Holy Grail. One of the more upsetting ones, though, was a document referring to a world-ending bomb a nuke that's 720,000 times stronger than the one dropped on Hiroshima. I don't want to know why we would even need that. I found contingency plans for different kinds of apocalypses. A nuclear winter, biological weapons, a viral outbreak. Some more peculiar ones were called the Mariana Trench Abnormality. The bluntly labelled Strange Man on the 15th Floor and one simply referred to as Blackout. There were recovered logs of skinwalker hunting expeditions, 911 transcripts from residents of a town in Texas that went missing in 1977, and even the journals that belonged to the people involved in the Dyatlov Pass incident. They didn't go insane because of the snow, apparently. I spent hours on there, looking through pages and pages of things that I felt like I wasn't supposed to see. I eventually came across a trailer to a silent film made back in 1910, one that apparently made people claw their eyes out after watching that nearly derailed the whole industry. There was a live stream of a hooded man sitting in front of a camera, a head crouched down. He eventually lifted his head. Even though he had no mouth, a deep, guttural hello came through my speakers. Somehow, I knew it came from him. I didn't stick around for that, though. There were obscure sets of step-by-step -step guides that involved things like cutting off your own limbs and sawing on a corpses, performing religious incantations in the middle of the Siberian forest, and going to coordinates that apparently housed captive fallen angels. It was unclear what any of these were supposed to achieve. There was also a 20 second long clip titled The Futility of Living. I didn't watch it. That's when I realized though that there was no way that even the highest form of organized government had full control of this. One of the scariest things about this whole experience was that I didn't find an end to the list no matter how far I scrolled down. I think that I eventually had a meltdown and just passed out, because I woke up on my floor in the middle of the night. I looked at my computer screen to see looped helicopter footage of a massive crab-like creature tearing apart a coastal island. I clicked off it, and I just sat there for the longest time. I couldn't comprehend what I was seeing, and I don't really think that I wanted to. Now, I'm not really sure why I kept going. My brain was screaming for me to take my computer out to the lawn and just smash it into pieces. But I did it. And I noticed something that I hadn't before. There was a small message at the bottom left hand corner of the screen. I don't know if it was always there or not. It was really hard to read, so I had to squint. It was more Latin. It translated as, are you satisfied? 
Uh, there were two options underneath it. Yes and no. Now, I knew the answer to this question. Hell no, I wasn't satisfied. I was horrified. Uh, scared for life, even. But I should have clicked on yes. If I had just clicked on yes, it would have taken me out of that godforsaken place. Uh, back to comfort and sanity. Even right now, I can't tell you why I clicked on no. But once I did, the page seemed to refresh. It was still the same basic setup, except there were only four links now. This time, there were no recognizable numbers or characters. Hell, it didn't look like anything that could have come from this world even. Just a collection of extremely crude symbols that didn't give off any sense of pattern or direction. I clicked on the first link. After about 20 seconds, I slammed my computer shut. Honestly, I can't describe to you what I saw. All I know is that I wasn't supposed to see it. And nobody should ever see anything like this. It's not only that it didn't make any sense. It's that I can't tell you why it didn't. I couldn't even begin to grasp the images of what I was seeing. I mean, it wasn't graphic or anything, not like that. I just couldn't recognize anything. I could make out things moving, but not in the way a creature on Earth has ever moved before. There were colors that I'd never seen. Just thinking about it gives me a splitting headache. This is my best attempt at visualizing it. We have three dimensions here on Earth. We can move forwards, backwards, left or right, 72.4 degrees southwest, etc. These things weren't restricted to that. I, I can't explain it any better than that. All I know is that I didn't want to watch one more second of it. I don't think I would have been able to anyway. I left my room, and for the first time in a while, I was planning to leave my house. I needed some fresh air. I needed to take a walk or something. Hell, I was thinking about running a marathon in the middle of the night, just to get my mind off of that shit for a few hours. I was putting on my jacket when I heard a knock at the door. I stopped dead in my tracks. Obviously... I wasn't opening up. About a minute and five more sets of knocks came before somebody spoke up. Open up. We know what you did, but we're not here to hurt you. We just want to talk. Uh, the tone wasn't threatening. Eventually, I obliged. I opened up my door to two tall, slim men in suits. They smiled at me. Can we come in? I still don't know how they found me. I thought for sure that I was off the grid. We sat down on the couch. I guess I was just waiting for answers at this point. One of them looked at me and said, So, what were you looking for? Uh, I don't know, but I'm not going back. I responded. He smiled again. Like this is what he wanted to hear. And the other one piped up. So who do you work for? His tone was a bit more aggressive. I just shook my head. Look, I didn't know what I was getting into. I wasn't looking for anything. They just stared at me for a while. Listen, I'm not going to tell anybody. Trust me. They finally responded. Uh, we're not worried about that. I doubt anybody would believe you. And there was another smile. And somehow, this one felt genuine. Uh, we just wanted to know where your priorities were. In retrospect, that was a really strange question. Just do us a favor and we'll go. I perked up at this. Uh, give us the device that you use to access it. I didn't ask any questions. 
Now I ran upstairs and basically tossed my laptop at them. They both smirked at me one last time before heading for the door. Just as they were about to leave, one of them turned back. I don't think you need to be told, but don't try this again, okay? And don't show anybody else how to get there either. We'll know. I didn't ask who they were, and I'm not sure that I would even want to know. It's been a week now, and I don't go on the internet so much anymore. After this, I'm going to just try and forget all this, to try and not think about it anymore. I've started having horrific nightmares. I've been seeing a therapist for that, but I don't think it's helping. Anyways, I'm not going to let this consume the rest of my life. But the thing is, is that I'm afraid that this might not be possible. There are some things that we aren't supposed to know about. Probably for our own safety and sanity. Don't try and seek them out. It's just better that way. However, it might be a bit too late for me. They say that curiosity killed the cat. It's funny. That almost feels like a personal attack at this point. I haven't forgotten about that night. I mean, it's not just something that you can stop thinking about, right? What the hell was that last thing that I saw? Strange thing is, it never even comes up in my nightmares. It's always the other stuff. I swear, I can see that dude with no mouth every time that I close my eyes. But maybe it's not so weird. My brain couldn't comprehend it the first time, so how could my subconscious produce a reaction? Shit. I just don't want to think about it anymore. But I just can't stop. You see, my problems aren't just in my head anymore. I thought that I was done with this shit after the men in black paid me a visit. I thought it was over. In retrospect, that was just wishful thinking. No, it was delusional even. After what I saw, I guess it doesn't work like that. I guess the world just isn't that simple. Here's what's been happening. It was Wednesday and I've been here three days since I've gone to work and I think that I'm being followed. No, I'm sure I am. The thing is, the first time, I didn't really notice. Whoever the hell they are, they've been using different vehicles. Always the same routine though. After work, I get into my car and start driving home. Another vehicle tails me until I turn into my driveway and they just drive past. Now, if it happens once, whatever. But three times? Under normal circumstances, I could call it a coincidence. For obvious reasons though, I can't do that right now. I'm not really sure what the hell they want. Maybe they're just trying to monitor me. Shit. I sure hope that's all they're trying to do. If that's the case, I'll just lay low and write it out. Just give them what they want. It's Thursday, and this time I tried to get a glimpse of them in my rear view. The windows were tinted though. Great. 
again. I pulled into my driveway and they just kept going. I know that I said that I was going to ride this out, but this kind of shit really does take a toll on you. I don't want to deal with whatever the hell this is anymore. I swear they're following closer and closer each time. So, it's Friday, and I did something different today. I took public transit instead of driving. I've never needed a drink more in my life, so I went to a bar after work. I guess this was more of an experiment, to see how closely they've been tracking me. And if they're bothered by the waiting, then they can go fuck themselves. I'm still living my life. Although, I couldn't keep my eyes off the windows the whole time I was in there, I have to admit. After getting sufficiently wasted, I flagged a cab down, and surprise, surprise, there they were, right behind us. But here's what I didn't expect. It was the same car from yesterday. It looks like they gave up on the incognito act. I'm not sure how they feel about that. Damn it. Something else also changed. They didn't just keep driving this time. After the cab dropped me off, I turned around to see that damn car parked half a block away from my house. I just went inside. The hell was I supposed to do? Calling the cops didn't even occur to me. But to be honest, I don't think they would have even helped. It's been three hours now and they're still there. I haven't been watching them the whole time, so I don't know whether or not they're actually in the car. Uh, That's not fun to think about. There's no way in hell that I'm sleeping tonight. It's about 2am now and I just got a text message. A private number. Here's what it said. Leave your house. Uh, Don't use the front door. They're still there. Uh, Come to the all-night diner about five blocks away. Uh, Don't think about driving. Uh, They'll know. Uh, Be quick. Uh, They're coming in soon. Uh, Don't get followed. Uh, Leave your lights on. I froze after reading this. Uh, They're coming in? Uh, For what? Who the hell is texting me? Now... I don't know what you would have done in this situation, but I took the warning. I was paranoid as hell at this point. Buzzed and tired, I put on a jacket and went out my back door. I also took a backpack with my other laptop in it. Not sure why, but I just felt like I needed to. I waited for a second before I climbed my own fence. When I was sure that nobody had noticed... I started heading towards the diner. After about 40 minutes, I finally got there. It would have been shorter, but I pretty much ducked into the bushes every time a car passed. I scanned the patrons, a table of drunk college kids, a few truckers, and a dude in a hoodie typing away on a computer in the back. He didn't look threatening, though. Actually, he was pretty scrawny. I made an educated guess. I walked up to his table and sat down. He looked up at me. Uh, hi. What do you want? Uh, you texted me? There was a brief pause and I got worried for a second. Was it not him? But he eventually broke the silence. Uh, Right. Did they follow you? Uh, no. I I don't think so. He nodded. All right. And then he laughed. Like this was supposed to be funny. (laughs) Man, you screwed up, didn't you? It was hard to disagree with that. (laughs) What were you doing anyways? What were you trying to find? Nothing. I swear. I just did it for the hell of it, I guess. He just stared at me in amused disbelief. Oh, well, that's fucking lame. It would have been cool if you were a spy or something at least. Look, who are you? 
How did you know that they were after me? And who are they anyways? I pelted him with questions. All right, all right, settle down there. I'm not going to tell you who they are, because honestly, I don't know either. But I will tell you that they don't have good intentions. Fantastic, I thought. Well, how do you know about them? He paused for a moment. They came after me. Uh, One second, I'm reading about demons on the moon. Uh, The next, I'm getting my door kicked down. Uh, This was months ago, and I skipped town. I was confused. Uh, Wait, what do you mean? Uh, They tried to kill me, dude. I couldn't believe this. And you were just viewing the links? Uh, That was it? Did you teach other people how to get there or something? He raised his eyebrow. Uh, No. Why do you ask? I was floored. Well, they didn't do that to me, I said. They just came by, took my laptop and gave me a warning. Now, it was his turn to look shocked. Really? He seemed to think about something for a while. He then proceeded to ask me what they look like. Uh, Just men in suits, I responded. Uh, What did they ask you? Uh, Was his follow-up question. Uh, Again, I just told him. But then I remembered the last thing that they said to me. You know, they also asked me what my priorities were. It was a a weird-ass question. His face went blank for a second. Yeah, yeah, it's strange, ain't it? What followed was an uncomfortable silence. I finally asked him the thing that had been on my mind ever since that night. That page with just the four links? What the hell is that supposed to be? He raised his eyebrow and told me that he didn't know what I was talking about. And this is where things got strange. After I told him a rough explanation of what I saw, his expression changed completely. I could make out a sudden flare in his demeanor. What did you type at the prompt? He asked me. Ah, what also seeks me? I answered. I was thoroughly confused at this point. Isn't that what you did as well? He just shook his head. Ah, no. He then shut his laptop and stood up. Well, where the hell are you going? I inquired. Listen, we've been here too long. Look, I know you have questions, but I can't answer them for you. Go to a motel tonight or something. And just like that, he was gone. Well, what was I going to do? Stop him? I still have no idea who the hell this guy is. The only thing that I got out of him was his name, Jackson, and even that's probably fake. Tired as hell and still a little bit drunk, I left the diner and tried to stay hidden as I looked for a nearby motel. Obviously, this was not fun. So now, here I am, sitting in some sketchy motel at 4.30am. I can barely keep my eyes open, but I also can't help but look over my shoulder every second that I'm awake. This is the pinnacle of shitty situations, I tell you. I guess I'll try and get some sleep. I mean, there's nothing else I can do. I'll figure it all out in the morning. So, it's Saturday now. Well, I guess it's been Saturday for a while, actually. It's 8am now, and I barely got any sleep. I have this creeping, ominous feeling in my gut that something just isn't right. I turned on the TV, anything to just clear my mind for a bit. But what I saw next did the opposite of that. It was a news report. 
a man strangled to death in a KFC bathroom. But the person murdered was one of the guys that came to my house and took my computer that night. No suspects. I just stared at the screen for the longest time. What the hell was going on? My phone suddenly buzzed. A different message from a private number. And this is what it said. Go to the swimming pool on 5th Street. In the men's locker room. Go to locker 128. The combination is 12 27 33. Further instructions are in there. Do so before this text gets intercepted. And don't bring your phone. Of course. How stupid was I? My phone was with me this whole time. Surely whoever was after me would have been able to track me. And this never even crossed my mind. Out of curiosity, I peeked outside my window. And sure enough... The car that's been following me was now parked right there. Uh, luckily for me, I caught my first glimpse of the driver and the passenger getting out. Uh, they were both wearing gloves and one was holding a briefcase. And they're walking towards the entrance right now. After I've emailed this to myself and a friend, I'm going to need to think quick. I've already dropped my phone in a toilet and I'm going to need to get rid of this laptop next. But people need to know that this happened. If you hear from me again, it looks like I found a way out of this. What a shit show this has been. Well, here I am again. I'm currently on a plane headed to Scottsdale, Arizona. I haven't actually been out of state in about six years. I thought I would eventually, just didn't expect it to be under these circumstances. Anyways, let me back up a bit first. This is what happened. Right after I disposed of the laptop, I heard my lock being tampered with. Somebody was trying to pick it. Now, I've never been great under pressure, so you could imagine how I was feeling. But the human mind is an interesting thing. When you think you're at the end of the line, your will to live really ramps up. The balcony, I thought. Only way out of this. Without hesitation, I ran out and climbed over it. Fortunately, I was on the second floor, so I didn't break my legs. But now came a decision. Run or hide. Uh, to be honest, both didn't seem too promising. Shit, I thought. I was panicking. And that's when I spotted Salvation. A cab parked on the other side of the lot. I bolted for it. I tapped on the window, startling the driver. Uh, Mr. Horvat? He asked. Well, no, it wasn't, but I nodded anyways. You said 8.40, didn't you? He looked at me with confusion. I finished early. Let's go. There was anxiousness in my voice, but I tried to hide it. The last thing I needed was for this guy to think that I was a lunatic and drive off. I got in, I told him the address, and we got out of there. As we left the lot, I looked back, and the two men I saw coming out of the car were now on the balcony where I just was. I could tell that there was a dead stare directed right at me behind their sunglasses. Despite all of this, 
relief washed over me. It was short-lived, however. I relayed the message then I got in my head. Do so before this text gets intercepted. That meant then I was still on the clock. If they don't know where I'm headed yet, they will soon. We finally got to the place about 15 minutes later, and as soon as I got in, I rushed into the locker room. It was mostly empty. I kept repeating the combination in my head, though. This was the only thing that I had. I didn't really care about getting answers before, but it seemed like I had no choice now. I finally found the locker. I don't know why this guy has chose such a massive place. 12 left, 27 right, 33 left, and I swung it open. Sitting there was an older Blackberry model and an envelope. I opened it up to find a plane ticket, $2,000 cash, and a sticky note. In horrific penmanship, the words check phone, password, snake tracks were scrawled across it. I obliged and booted up the ancient device. I remember being slightly amused, in fact. I always begged my parents for one of these when I was a kid, and this was a far cry from that. I took a quick look through the phone. It was mostly blank. No apps downloaded, no pictures, nothing really. There was only one contact, a bluntly named Call Me. So... I did. After just one ring, a voice answered. There was a sense of tentativeness in his tone, and somehow it sounded familiar. Who is this? Uh, well, how the hell was I supposed to answer this? Should I say my name? I got your message. I finally responded. There was a brief pause, and his response... It caught me off guard. What's your religious affiliation? His tone had gotten a lot more aggressive. Why the hell was he asking me this? I thought. I didn't have enough energy to question him though. Uh, I was raised Protestant but now agnostic, I guess, was my answer. He seemed to breathe a quick sigh of relief. Uh, then he cut the line. Well, shit. Is this guy nuts or something? My thoughts were interrupted as I got a message. He'd sent me an address and a room number. Meet me was the only other thing he'd typed. I looked at it for a second before coming to my senses. I'm an idiot. I should have just taken the stuff and bolted. I heard the door to the locker room swing open and then footsteps coming towards where I was, uh, sprinting actually. I flipped shit, I shoved the stuff in my pockets and started looking for a way out. Again, there was really only one option here. I started making a break for the pool entrance, and as I ran, a fucking gunshot started ringing out behind me. I could tell that they were using silences, but boy, that doesn't do a whole lot when you're only 40 feet away. I suddenly felt a sharp pain in my side. I saw a bullet penetrate a locker right up ahead. Oh, fuck, that didn't miss by much. I ran faster than I thought I was ever able to. I almost slipped into the damn pool as I stumbled out. The lifeguard shouted after me as I burst out of the emergency exit. But I couldn't stop there. I hurried along, making turns every minute, looking over my shoulder the whole time. It's a good thing I was downtown. I blended into the sea of people easily. And at one point, I saw a pair of policemen. I considered telling them. I honestly did. But what's that going to do? They'll search for those two guys, turn up with nothing, monitor my house for a couple of days and then call everything off. It wasn't going to solve anything. I finally ducked into a hair salon. I just... I couldn't run anymore. The barber just looked at me like I was insane. Screw it, I thought. Might as well make myself less recognizable while I'm here, I guess. I got him to shave it all off. 
I spent the rest of the day making various purchases. I got a used laptop, a new set of clothes, some bandages and a pair of shades. At least something good came of this, I guess. The flight was supposed to be in in a couple of hours at this point, so I called a cab and made my way there. And that's where I am now. I've got a long trip ahead of me still, so uh, let's see what happens next, I guess. As I made my way out of the airport, I recoiled at the heat. Shit, it's November alright. How does anyone live here during the summer? I called another cab, I got to the address. It was a holiday inn. I laughed at myself. How ominous, I thought. I made my way up to the room and knocked on the door, and a billion thoughts were running through my head. What if this was a trap? I actually thought about just running away for a second, but I realized that that wouldn't accomplish shit. After about a minute, the door opened. A wave of surprise washed over me, but in retrospect, this is exactly who I should have been expecting. It was the other guy that came to my house that night, the one that didn't get strangled. He didn't look great, however. He had a black eye and a busted lip and just looked tired in general. He looked me over before gesturing me in. He had a slight limp as he walked. Nice haircut, he muttered softly. He sat down on the bed and I sat on the couch across from him. There was a long silence. The whole time, he just stared at the ground. To be honest, I didn't know what to say, so I just said nothing. He finally spoke up though. Might as well let you know what's going on. He then proceeded to just let it all out. About four years ago, there was an incident in the Paris catacombs. I got chills after hearing this. Four teenagers decided that it was a good idea to wander off during a tour. I guess then they got lost or something because they weren't there at the end. The police pretty much swept everywhere and there was no sign of them. Eventually, the government decided to set up infrared cameras all around the place just to see what would turn up. And one day, one of the cameras picked up movement. And nobody anticipated what they were going to see next. It was hell manifested. An abomination of writhing limbs somehow stuck together squirmed across the screen. There were four human heads stuck to the top of this thing. And you can guess who they were, right? I was beyond speechless at this point. I thought about that video of the catacombs. Glad I didn't stick around for the grand reveal. He continued. They decided to send elite forces down there to exterminate it. Apparently, it took out 12 men before they put it down. Now, the question was what they were going to do with the video. They couldn't just get rid of it, but they didn't want anybody to see it either. And this was around the same time the whole Snowden thing was going on, so they didn't feel comfortable with just using government servers. And so this is where that website that you saw comes into play. They got the most seasoned technical experts they had to bury it somewhere deep in the internet. And I'm talking about as deep as they could go. Nobody was supposed to know about it. Nobody was supposed to find it. And nobody was even supposed to know what to look for. I racked my brain over this. Sure, I knew my way around, but... There was no way in hell that I was on par with government experts. So, how did I find it? He continued, and it worked well for a while. They made a pact with governments worldwide. 
anything they deemed unfit for public knowledge, it went on that site. There were even precautions. For every real thing on there, they posted four fake ones. For the select few that actually managed to find it. Wait, what? I couldn't believe this. He just chuckled. Yeah, <laughs> most of that stuff you saw was total bullshit. Most. The videos, they're actually harder to fake. I didn't know how to feel about all of this. I was slightly relieved, I guess. Just slightly. He kept on. The logic behind this was that once people found these things, uh, they'd look further into them. However, since they were fabricated, nothing would come up and the page would be disregarded. Uh, just a gag site. At least, uh, that was the idea. Oh, I knew what he was getting at. Uh, what about the people that started looking into the real things? Uh, he sighed. <sighs> look... Nobody would have given a shit if they started spouting it off to their friends or on the internet. People would have thought that they were crazy. It's the damn people that just have to go and find proof though. The ones that plan to publicize it. Yeah, they get silenced. I was about to say something, but I think he noticed because he cut me off. Look, don't put that moralistic shit on me. They didn't have to do it. It was their choice. They were committing a crime. Do you really think public knowledge about any of these things would help anybody? No, it wouldn't. Sometimes, ignorance is bliss, alright? To be honest, I had to agree. But here's where things really went to shit, okay? He went on. Before, there would be maybe two breaches a month. And then it skyrocketed up to 20, and then 50. They looked into it. Apparently, there were rumors circulating around the deep and dark web. A rumor about a page that held secrets that nobody was supposed to see. They decided to find out how easy it really was to access this place, just from reading forums and shit. And it took the experts about 20 minutes to find it just by solving weird fucking riddles and then following these concealed links that would spawn for them. And then there was the final prompt. What do you seek? You've seen it, no? I nodded. Apparently, there's a lot of different answers that could work. Anyways, it didn't make any sense. Everybody that was supposed to know about this was grilled. Somebody had to be doing this, right? But nobody fessed up. Honestly, everybody seemed genuine when they said that they didn't do it. But they knew the consequences. And after a brutally in-depth investigation, nothing was resolved. And then it hit me. Back in 2010, they had also finalized an experimental AI. I'll spare you the details, but it went off the rails. Nobody could control it. And as soon as they thought that they could corner it into a virtual trap, it just disappeared. It didn't come up again. That is, until now. He paused after that, like he was waiting for me to connect the dots. So, you think that this AI resurfaced and is now directing people there? I asked. He said that he doesn't think that that's the case. He knows it is. It's the only feasible explanation, he stated. But why? Honestly, I don't know, he responded. I was starting to get a hunch now about why this was all happening to me. These people, they aren't after me because I saw those links, are they? He just nodded. It's what I saw after, wasn't it? And you think this AI has something to do with it? Another nod. Well, what did I see? I couldn't tell you. 
there's some things that I don't even know about. All I can tell you is that there are some groups, uh, some people out there, uh, beyond any government that are after this kind of stuff, this forbidden knowledge. And somehow, they know that you've seen it. And they want to know what you know. And they came after you as well, I asked. Yeah, they know that we talk to you. A wave of guilt came over me. Did I get that guy killed? However, that guilt quickly turned into frustration. Well, what the hell am I supposed to know? I don't know what the hell it was I saw. A dry chuckle came out of him. Well, <laughs> they don't care, do they? They'll just jump at anything. And who do you work for? The government? I finally asked. Uh, the question had been on my mind since I got here. Uh, sort of was all that he responded with. Uh, he got up, uh, taking out a pair of car keys. Uh, we gotta figure this out, and uh, we gotta go. Uh, go where? I asked. Uh, Vegas. In any other situation, I would have been ecstatic. Uh, we went outside and he led me to an older, beat-up sedan. Inconspicuous, he said with a smile. Uh, I could tell that he was just trying to lighten the mood. Uh, the drive was long and arduous and we barely spoke. Uh, my brain was just fried at this point, so I didn't bother asking any more questions. I did remember one peculiar conversation we had, though. So, listen, if anything happens to me, there should be a file on the Blackberry named Contingency. Everything you need to know will be there. I remember feeling flustered. Uh, what? What could happen to you? I responded. I don't know. It's just in case, I guess. Just don't lose that phone, okay? In reality, I knew that there were a lot of things that could have happened. I just didn't want to admit it. He woke me up when we arrived at McCarran, and I was confused. Uh, you have plane tickets? I don't need them, he responded. He got out of the car and I followed him in. And what happened next was strange. He just walked past everyone. The check-in, the security, everybody. They didn't even pay attention to him. Not to me either. And that's when I started to wonder who the hell this guy really was. As we walked past the various stores and restaurants set up near departures, he took a sharp turn. I stumbled keeping up. He walked towards an unassuming door, set up right between two shops. He swung it open and I followed. We walked down a bunch of corridors, turning every so often. Various men in suits passed us but didn't seem to acknowledge our presence. We finally got to another door and this one required a keycard. He took one out and scanned it. I didn't realize how huge this place really was until I thought about it after. We must have passed at least 15 other hallways. Anyways, the door opened up to what looked like a long flight of stairs. We trekked down for about 5 minutes before we got to what looked like another terminal. Now, it didn't look futuristic or anything. It just looked like a, a regular damn terminal. Uh, surely there's no planes taking off here, right? I asked. And he said that I was right. And that's when I noticed the train tracks. Now we wait. And he sat down on a bench. Well, great. I'd given up trying to piece this together in my head at this point. So, I didn't even bother asking what this place was. Let's just see what happens, 
I thought. But as I'd soon find out, things are not just that simple these days. I spotted a washroom sign towards the back and I headed for it. As I was washing my hands, after finishing up, I noticed what looked like a card stuck into the side of the mirror. I plucked it out and looked at it. It was a standard business card size, just plain white with black text, but here's what it said. From far and wide, we search for meaning. As seconds pass, since the time of weaning, our destiny is sealed. We'll face the wraith. We don't need hope. We have our faith. We will not stop until we're dust. All for God, in whom we trust. Creepy, I thought. And then I turned it over. And in big bold letters was F-O-T-L-G. No idea what that was supposed to be. However, in that moment, I felt that something just wasn't right. It's that creeping sensation you get when something just feels off. I needed to tell him, whoever the hell he is, about this. I opened the door and he was gone. I searched around the terminal for a bit, but he was nowhere to be found. Hell, there was nobody else here. And the place started rumbling slightly. The train was coming. Well, I sure as hell wasn't getting on by myself. I looked around a bit more before I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. <sighs> Great, I thought. He's back. And then I realized that uh -huh. it wasn't just one pair of steps. There were multiple. And instead of seeing a familiar face... I was greeted with four of what I assumed to be men. I couldn't tell though because their faces were covered with a burlap sack that had eye holes carved out. Kind of like the one Scarecrow wears in Batman Begins. The only difference was a symbol that seemed to be spray painted on where the forehead should be. It was simple. A vertical semicircle with angular arrows going through it. As I recall, the rest of their get-up was normal, just plain street clothes. I was frozen at this point, and then I realized that one of them had liquid dripping off his glove, a dark liquid. The next few moments were a complete blur. I remember the train pulling up and those guys starting to run towards me. I started bolting for the train. And it was really weird. There was only one section and one set of doors. I don't think I saw a driver either. And as I ran up to it, the doors opened automatically. I remember frantically looking for a shut button, but there wasn't one. I just stared in horror as these freaks got closer and closer. And as they got within about 10 meters, I closed my eyes and just prayed for the best. I opened them when I heard kicking and banging at the door and it wasn't opening up for them. I watched their crazed eyes follow me as the train started moving. I was safe, but only for now. I turned on my phone again and took a thorough look through it, and sure enough, the text file he mentioned, it was there. I guess that I'll read it soon, after I'm done with this. Now, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's waiting for me there. My head is pounding. All I know is that I should have just stayed on Google.
I'm not so sure what to think anymore. I mean, it's not like anything was clear-cut before, but the world just continues to make less and less sense. I opened up the contingency file, and this is what it contained. Failsafe, agent incapacitated, alias Jack Rust, identity redacted, custom message. Uh, hello there. If you're listening to this, I suppose that I'm out of commission. Shame, I guess. I'm going to assume that we've at least made it to the terminal. Here's what you need to do. Get on the train. Do so as soon as it comes. There's only a 10 second window when it'll open for anybody. Now, it's going to be the fifth. Count them. The fifth stop that you'll need to get off at. There won't be any announcements, no indications, nothing, so don't fall asleep, just pay attention, okay? This train goes really fast, but it'll take some time, so be patient. While you're in there, don't look out the windows. I mean, there's nothing to look at anyways, you'll be in a tunnel. Nevertheless, it's just better that you refrain from doing so. You see, we've been having problems recently. Sometimes, something stares back at you, and you can't really look away. Now, what I'm going to mention next isn't likely. I'd say that it's a 1 in 1,000 chance, in fact. But you don't have the means to deal with it, so you'll need a heads up. If at any one of the stops you see or hear the door opening, hide under the seats. There shouldn't be anybody getting on right now, so just close your eyes and wait for them to leave. Now, if they're still there after the fourth stop, well, I'm sorry. Once you've arrived at the fifth, make sure to get out. It'll be another terminal, a very small one. There should be a stairs to the right and a ladder to the left. Do not even think about going down the stairs. As you go up the ladder, it should start getting darker. Don't worry, this is what's supposed to happen. Just keep feeling upwards. Eventually, you should touch something solid. It's a fake rock. Push it up and climb out. Put it back when you're done though. You should now be in a dead wheat field. This is Texas. It's between Crockett and Sutton County, to be specific. As soon as you get up there, start looking around. There should be a small, abandoned farmhouse, visible a few miles in the distance. Go towards that. Once you've gone in, look for a basement. The place isn't big, and you should find it easy enough. Once you have, go down there. Now, the lights don't work, so it'll be dark. Turn the brightness up on your phone if you have to. You should be looking for a big red door. There's only one, so if you think you've found it, you have. There's going to be a numerical set of buttons right by the handle. The password is 5325678. Now, this next part's a doozy. Not that you have to do anything crazy. It's just what I'm about to tell you. You see, the reason these people knew where to find you was because they went through us first. We'd been monitoring you ever since you started getting close to finding that page. I didn't tell you because, well, why would I? Apparently, there was a mole informant in our midst. We believed that he was a member of a cult that we thought went defunct a while ago. The faction of the Lost Gods. That's what they call themselves. I won't go into detail on them here. All I'll tell you is that they would go to the ends of the earth to find what you saw that day. That's their one and only objective. They aren't the only group seeking this, though. However, 
they're the only one that we're worried about. I guess uh, once they started hearing about those riddles, they thought that this thing was trying to communicate with somebody, uh, with them, trying to lead them there. But uh, this is the part that didn't make any sense. Uh, the thing that had stumped all of us. You were never supposed to see what you did. It wasn't supposed to be there. We have no clue why it was. Uh, one of the strangest things was that nobody had even created that page that it popped up on. We don't know how you found it. You were the first person that saw it since we took it off the site, in fact. And this is where things got hairy for us. As soon as the informant noticed this, he called in a raid on our Texas headquarters. That's the one you're going to. It was a massacre. They stole our equipment and started tracking you down themselves. Luckily for me, I wasn't there for that. I was already on my way to you. Now, we don't work for the government. We just work with them. But these politicians, they have a real antiquated code of ethics. A real antiquated idea of how to fix things. You see, these cult members aren't so easy to find. If they were, they would have been neutralized a long time ago. Because of that, there exists a contingency protocol for this exact purpose. A blackout is what they call it. If they ever found out that this group had any chance of finding whatever it was that you saw, they'd put it into motion. Trust me, that's not going to be fun for anybody. And they aren't willing to take any more risks. That's why we didn't tell them why we didn't tell most people in our own organization they might spill the beans however if you're still listening to this that means that desperate measures can wait once you've gone in go directly straight until you've reached what looks like a control room in the far right corner there should be an older desktop mounted on the wall luckily that's one of the few things they didn't take Boot it up. It's going to prompt you for a password. Type in Primordial. A trapdoor should open in the middle of the room. Walk down those steps and you should find yourself facing a bunch of file cabinets. Start searching through them. You're looking for a folder under the name Kane Hunter. He's an old friend. It's ordered alphabetically, so it shouldn't be that hard to find. That folder should contain his address. I understand that this is a lot of work for just one piece of information. However, this guy moves around so much that I just didn't bother keeping up. Uh, you need to go and find him. He'll have the answers that I don't. And at this point, he's our best shot. Uh, just tell him that Ben sent you. I'll leave you with this message. Mankind must not go back to hiding in fear. No one else will protect us, and we must stand up for ourselves. This government protocol is not the way to go. Good luck. That was the end of the message. This was a lot to take in, to say the least. But it sounded like I had a job to do. Luckily, nothing else got on the train with me. It took a while, but I finally got to the basement door in the farmhouse. As soon as I walked in, a wall of stench hit me. I reflexively gagged. A massacre indeed. Those words rang through my head. I found a light switch on the wall and flicked it. And as the stale incandescent light washed over the place, I understood what he meant. It really was a massacre, and nobody was there to clean it up. Holding my breath, I stepped over the decaying, uniformed corpses. 
As much as I would try to avoid looking at them, I just couldn't stop myself from glancing down every so often. I was about to pass out once I reached the control room. I followed the instructions and found the folder. As soon as I did, I got the hell out of there. Once I was back outside, I read through it. Kane Hunter was 45 years old, and he lived in Hong Kong. Oh shit, I thought. I was starting to hate traveling. It took me a while to find a road. I eventually managed to hitchhike into a town. From there, I got another ride to Dallas-Fort Worth International. And that's where I am right now. I'm tired beyond belief at this point. And it doesn't help that the back of my damn neck's itching like hell. The flight was long, so I got to contemplate the past week. There were a lot of unanswered questions still lingering. And I really didn't know what to expect from Kane Hunter. I remembered that train terminal, uh, the card that I found in the washroom, FOTLG, a faction of the Lost Gods. <sighs> Shit. I finally arrived and cabbed to this guy's address. I was running low on funds at this point. During the drive, I watched as the glimmering lights of the city moved past me. On the surface, the world just seemed so straightforward. I guess it really starts unraveling when you look into it. I got dropped off at an unassuming apartment complex. I guess you could call it middle class. I buzzed his room number and it took a while for somebody to finally answer. Uh, who's this? He sounded surprised, as if he wasn't used to visitors. I took a second to think about what I was going to say to this guy. Uh, hey, um, Ben sent me. I need help, was my ultimate response. Almost instantly, I heard the front entrance unlock. Well, here we go, I thought. I started making my way up to the seventh floor. As I was about to knock on his door, it opened up. A rather unkempt middle-aged man pulled me into his room. He was looking extremely anxious, and he paced around as I took a seat. He finally stopped, turning to me. What do you mean you need help? His otherwise deep voice croaked as he said this. I knew that I was about to tell him something that he didn't want to hear. Listen, I, um, I saw that thing, and now there's people after me. His facial expression contorted as he heard this. Uh, who's after you? Uh, did you know? His speech was quick and discombobulated. Um, the faction of the lost gods is what I think they're called, was my response. And now, his face went completely pale. They're back? I flinched as he cursed loudly right after this. He sat down, burying his face into his hands, and he looked back up at me. What happened to Ben? My silence was enough of an answer, and he just nodded. He was... he was a good guy. I just nodded back in response. I heard him mumble something under his breath, but I couldn't make it out. And now, it was time for me to ask the big question. The question that nobody seemed to have the answer to. So, what was it that I saw? He just stared at me for a few seconds. And then he finally spoke up. So, I used to work on a space station named Kronos-1. You heard of it? Uh, no, I hadn't. And uh, that's what I told him. Well, uh, that's because you're not supposed to. And now, I really had no idea where this was all going. Uh, he went on to tell me about how the Kronos-1 
used to orbit space, uh, 1,500 kilometers away from the ISS. It was meant to be used for navigation and communication, he stated. <coughs> That's what they told us, anyways. Uh, they were doing other stuff up there for sure, though. Uh, why else would they not tell the public it existed? Anyways, it didn't last long. Uh, one day, uh, we get a message from NASA. Uh, there was a signal of sorts, uh, coming from somewhere deep in space. Uh, well, uh, more like uh, some kind of anomaly. Uh, something that just didn't make sense. Uh, they didn't elaborate on what it was supposed to mean. Anyways, uh, they estimated that it came from beyond the Kuiper Belt. All of this was strange, of course. So, they decided to check it out. He paused, letting off a quick sigh as he did so. So, they sent an interstellar probe towards this signal. It was estimated to reach there in about nine years. And it just so happens that about nine years later, I'm back up in space after taking a hiatus on Earth. While there, we get another message. The probe had reached where the signal had approximately been emanating from. Uh, they were going to transmit a feed for us to watch. Uh, I raised my eyebrow. He just chuckled at my confusion. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've come a lot further in terms of space technology than the public has led to believe. At this point, I don't think you should be surprised, right? Anyways, everybody's crowded around the monitors, waiting to see what the hell this probe picked up. Keep in mind that there were only 10 people in the room at the time. It was too tight to fit more, so we were going to be the first ones aboard who would see it. The transmission eventually blinked on the screen. He stopped, rubbing his temple as he did so. It almost looked like it hurt him to think about. Everything... Everything just went by quick. It only took a few seconds for the screaming to start. People were banging their damn heads on the floors and walls. It was chaos. Everybody lost their minds after seeing what was on the monitor. The only reason I survived was because I didn't actually get a glimpse of it. I was still in the bathroom when the transmission came through and I got out as soon as I heard the commotion. I still passed out though. I guess I'm not so good with blood after all. All I remember before hitting the floor was seeing a lone person still glued to the screen. He was the only one watching at this point. When I woke up, they started asking me questions. But honestly, I had no answers for them. I didn't see it. Wait, so what was the cause of death for them? I asked. A suicide. Mostly blunt force. He responded. Everybody in that room found a way to kill themselves. What the hell? I thought. Was this really what I had seen as well? So, what happened to the other guy? The guy that you said that was still watching? Well, he passed out as well but only for a minute. Other than that, he said that he was fine. I never even really brought it up, and when they asked him what he'd seen, he'd just shrug and say that he didn't know what they were talking about. I knew him, actually. His name was Blake. He'd always been a strange guy. There was another pause, and I kept trying to work this thing out of my head. Kane kept going but uh, that wasn't the end of his story I perked up at this he got fired soon after he seemed to just stop caring about anything that was going on around him he'd make these <coughs> strange dark outbursts every so often and it would scare the hell out of everybody he worked with honestly it looked like he was going insane after his last day, he went off the grid. 
his family, uh, the few friends that he had, none of them knew where he went or where he was going. Uh, there were no traces of him anywhere. But unbeknownst to everybody, he was going around the country uh, recruiting people into some cult that he'd created. And uh, you can guess what it's called, right? It didn't take me long to put it all together. The faction of the Lost Gods. Yeah, uh, that's right. He continued. Uh, he'd even written and released a manifesto explaining why this was necessary. He'd go on about how there was something inherently wrong with the inner workings of our external world and that we weren't even supposed to exist. Apparently, our system was corrupted, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. He was batshit. Or, or maybe it was what he'd seen that made him that way. He went on to explain how Blake had been looking for something the whole time that he'd been recruiting members. He'd been looking for the probe footage. Uh, you see, uh, that probe is still there, uh, transmitting whatever the hell that thing is to a feed that only the government had access to. Uh, I'll assume that uh, you've seen the site where all the sensitive knowledge goes, right? Uh, I nodded. Uh, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. At first, uh, that's where they stuffed it. According to them, a few hackers banging their heads on keyboards every now and then uh, wasn't that big of a deal. But after what had happened on Kronos, uh, almost nobody dared to look at it. Uh, the few who tried, well, you know the story. But here's where things got incomprehensibly fucked. Uh, what I'm about to tell you almost nobody knows about. Uh, this includes 99% of government agents. Uh, he took out a cigarette carton and lit one up. Uh, he took a long, heavy drag before continuing. So, after about six months, uh, I went back to the Kronos. Uh, they offered me a severance package to just retire and keep my mouth shut. But I decided against it. It was too cocky. I tried to pretend like what I saw didn't affect me. But that shit was a mistake. He ashed his cigarette and lit another one. It was a routine work day. We were finishing up some maintenance when we heard a deep humming sound coming from somewhere outside the station. It was honestly like nothing we'd ever heard before. Even now, I can't replicate what it sounded like in my head. It was just strange. A bunch of people started staring at the windows just to see what was happening. I didn't join in. After that probe footage, my curious side pretty much disappeared. However, what happened next made me question uh, what kind of universe we really live in. I was eating lunch in the mess hall when I heard a commotion coming from the hallways. I would have checked it out, but that's when the screaming started. It wasn't normal. Honestly, it didn't sound like anything that a human being should have been able to produce. I remember looking at everybody else in the room and they weren't moving. We were all on the same page. A couple of guys actually barricaded the entrance with chairs. However, we couldn't keep our eyes off of it. There was some kind of light bleeding in from the cracks under and above the door. But something was wrong about it. The light wasn't any color that we'd seen before. And the familiarity of these descriptions got my mind racing. This was it, wasn't it? This was what I had seen. He continued. 
I remember getting lightheaded just from looking at it for a few seconds. And the next hours were excruciating. The screams didn't stop. Our collective sanity was being pushed to the brink. We all just sat, fingers in our ears and eyes closed, waiting for the end of this shit. Eventually, the door opened up and we were escorted out. I remember looking around to see the white walls of the station, now stained with red. 90% of the crew that day died. We had questions, of course, about what happened. However, everybody that would have known was now dead. He leaned back in his chair, fished another cigarette out of the carton. This time, it was accompanied by a swig of whiskey, and he went on. And I arrived back on Earth shortly after that. This time, they didn't offer me my job back. Just a severance check and a non-disclosure. Though, it's not like I cared at this point. I would have quit regardless. Now, here's the connection to what you saw. That day, I was at my house, mulling over my life. And then I heard a knock at my door. It was Ben. He asked me what the hell had happened on Kronos. And I told him. But the thing that I didn't understand is how the hell that he knew that something had even happened. He had never even worked with NASA. So I asked him about it. He said that a wave of distress calls from the station all came through at once. They all described exactly what I had gone through. The problem was they had no means of dealing with this. It would have taken too long to organize a rescue mission. Everybody was at a loss for what to do. And that's when the higher-ups came up with something off the cuff. They had a hunch. It was actually more of an experiment, to be honest. They checked up on the website. And sure enough, it had been breached once again. Somebody was viewing the probe footage. They tracked it down to an abandoned warehouse in San Antonio, which is where Ben was at the time. At that point, he was just a field agent, so they contacted and told him to go check it out. He drove there, along with a SWAT team. When they arrived, it was a bloodbath. They started getting shot at as soon as they walked in. Whoever was doing it was trying to protect something. Half the team was killed before they managed to secure the place. They detained the shooters and started sweeping the rest of the building. There was nothing on the upper floors, but then they got to the basement. There was just one person down there, sitting in front of a computer monitor. They approached him slowly, barking at him to put his hands up, and he just ignored everything. A SWAT member eventually got close to him, and that's when he started screaming out of nowhere and shot himself in the head. There's no doubt that he got a glimpse of the screen. Nobody approached him after that. They all just kept pointing their weapons at him and telling him to turn around. And the guy eventually did. He said that it was Blake. Ben apparently recognized him because he'd become infamous around the governmental circles. He said that there was blood seeping from his eyes and nose, a skin pale as the moon, and he only said one thing. Cain stopped and sighed. He took a big swig of the whiskey and looked at me dead center. He said, you can't stop it. If this doesn't happen today, it'll happen eventually. Our reckoning has yet to come. Ben said that this chilled him to the bone. 
and he told me that Blake had said it in such a tone and conviction that just made him feel despair and emptiness inside. And he shot him right after that, as well as the monitor. They rounded up the rest of the cult members and took them into questioning. And they wouldn't cooperate, obviously. They all just repeated the same words over and over. Some weird fucking motto or something. Anyways, the higher-ups got there a couple of hours later. They congratulated Ben and told him to go home. The distress reports had finally stopped coming in from Kronos. Wait, I interjected. The reports? Did they stop as soon as Blake got shot? Kane chuckled. It was a dry one. No humor in it. Yeah. <laughs> he continued. You're figuring it out, aren't you? Here's the conclusion they came to. Whatever that probe was picking up, whatever Blake was watching, it was watching him back. Somehow, they were communicating with each other. This was horrifying to think about. But Kane continued. He was sending something towards Earth. Something beyond our comprehension that we were never meant to see. Who the hell knows what it wants from us? Probably nothing good. Anyways, they decided to make sure that nobody else ever saw it again. They disconnected from the probe, stopped the stream altogether. I'm sure the thought process was that if we don't seek it out, then it won't notice us. Wait, what? I nearly shouted at him. How the hell did I see it then? Well, that's what I was wondering, he said. Uh, you got an answer? I tried telling him about the AI, uh, but the words just stumbled out of my mouth into an incoherent mess. He just looked at me in confusion. An AI? Uh, what the hell are you talking about? He asked. Uh, on that website, uh, there was another prompt. It brought me there. That's how I found it. Prompts? What are you talking about? Uh, screw it, I thought. Uh, he clearly didn't know about it. There were still just too many questions pressing against my brain anyways. So, I didn't linger on this. So, how many other people do you know that have seen it? I asked. He scoffed. <laughs> Uh, the ones that are alive? Uh, you. This sent chills down my spine. Uh, he went on. Which begs the question, how long did you look at it for? Just a couple of seconds, right? No, I responded. Uh, it was nearly half a minute. Uh, after I said this, his face went blank. I just shrugged. Look, I don't... I don't know what to make of any of this. Was all I managed to stammer out. With a shocked, contemplative expression on his face, Kane just looked up at the ceiling. As he did this, the words from the contingency message rang through my head. You were the first one that had seen it since we took it down. But... Why me? Why was I so special? Why did I have to see it? Cain started speaking again. You know, computers may know more about humanity than we ever will. I just stared at him in confusion. What an odd statement to make. He went on. If it actually was an AI that sent you to that page... Maybe, maybe it means something. It means something? Like what? I retorted. Well, nobody else seems to be able to handle seeing that thing. But like Blake, you appear to be an exception. I really thought about this. 
he was right, wasn't he? Whatever the hell this thing is, it seemed to push people to the brink of insanity after just a few seconds of exposure. I mean, I sure as hell didn't know what I saw, and I certainly didn't like seeing it. But I was more or less in a normal state of mind afterward. However, there was one more question that I just couldn't ignore. So, those members of the cult that were detained, they weren't the only ones, were they? There were other members. Kane nodded. They tried to tell themselves that they were it, that this was done. That's what everybody wanted to believe. But underestimating Blake's influence was the biggest mistake they could have made. At this point, I didn't want to think about it anymore. I needed a break from this discussion, so I asked him if there was somewhere I could rest. He told me that there was a spare mattress in the closet. I need to sleep, but not before I finish getting this out. A million thoughts are still running through my head as I write this. Ben said that this guy was our best shot, but nothing's been resolved. Hell, what was he supposed to do? Maybe this blackout contingency was necessary. If everything I've heard is true, it might be the only option. Fuck, this itch on the back of my neck is killing me. Anyways, it looks like I'm going to have to make a decision soon. Shit, Kane and I just heard somebody trying to open the door. He took a look through the people and told me that there were people with weird masks on standing outside. Fuck. This is not good. G'day mates, so before the video starts I just wanted to thank Lazy Masquerade for helping me out with this one. It's been great working with him on a couple of videos and I hope in the future we can do it again. I'll provide a link below to his channel and I really encourage you guys to go check out his stuff as he has a lot of talent and he's a really top bloke. I also contributed to his most recent video so be on the lookout for that one guys. But anyway, without further ado. Let's oh. begin. Number four. In 2014, after hearing all of the horror stories, I wanted to check the deep web out myself. In a way, I kind of expected nothing other than scam sites for assassins, people requesting CP, and some underground markets. However, I prepared myself for the worst and, frankly, I was more worried about getting in trouble with the authorities rather than having my mind bleached for the near future. Even after two to three hours of procrastination, nothing prepared me for what I saw. It was during the middle of the day when I began my search. Of course, there's no deep web Google or anything, but rather a wiki with a lot of links. The links are different than the links you may know of. These links have no way of knowing what lays behind them. Just numbers and a dot onion at the end. Of course, unless previously defined and listed on the wiki page, it was boring at first. A lot of dead sites, more than expected eBay style markets for weapons, military grade mind you, various services and of course a lot of drugs. I came across a chat room where I saw a darker side of people I never thought was possible. So many people that were mentally ill, threatening others, requesting CP. It was truly disgusting. Think of the people who walk down dark streets of a bad neighborhood but with anything they desired at their fingertips. Two hours later, I came across one site that ended my little adventure in the wastes of human consciousness. 
A cult site, perhaps, with little info other than an email address and some religious mumbo-jumbo. However, there was a video embedded in the site's homepage. Like a naive child, I clicked it without a care in the world. The video was shot on a crappy video camera. Perhaps it was shot in the early to mid-2000s. It was a man with a mask and a knife. As quickly as that scene showed up, another presented itself. He was cutting something in a similar fashion to a butcher. It was then and there I realised the body was bipedal and without fur. It was a human being. He was cutting the legs at the buttocks level. A new scene shows the decapitation of the head. Then another shot of the man with the mask, followed by a picture of a church with a weird symbol. This was a cult recruiting website. It was followed by more bodies being cut up and hung in ways more gruesome than you may expect. Shortly after, I turned my computer off, and I stayed away from it for quite some time. This was my first and last visit to the deep web. I have never contemplated going back since. Number three. This was back before Google. Web pages were, for the most part, still very basic HTML and JavaScript. Hardly anyone used CSS. Only discussion boards and some banking sites had anything approaching mature front-end, back-end combinations. This is a real deep web story, not just one about illicit activities online. I was browsing random blogs, GeoCity sites and the like, just going from link to link. Eventually I came upon an odd page. It appeared to be random thoughts from different people, but for the time it was very well designed. Eventually I came upon an odd page. It appeared to be random thoughts from different people, but for the time it was very well designed. The messages seemed to be cryptic in nature, like several people trying to pass secret notes. I started through the source and hidden in the comments of a JavaScript were various IP addresses. I gathered all the IPs in a text file and began enumerating. Some were routers with banner messages I could tell net to, almost all at universities. The default Cisco credentials from back in the day worked on most of them, but I didn't poke around. A few of the IPs were web servers with little to nothing on them, mostly APAC on Linux or some BSD, at least one IIS server I can recall. I finally came up on a web server with a huge directory of HTML files and TIFF images, with a few smaller subdirectories containing the same. NSLOOKUP returned no reverse records for the IP. A visual route traced it as far as Colorado. The HTML files appeared to be records a psychologist or similar mental health professional would keep. The images were of faxes, apparently of both military and medical nature. As I browsed from a subdirectory back to the parent, at the top was a new HTML file named something like one hello therehtml The timestamp was from right that minute. I opened it, and in plain text was the message, We see you. No quotes, all lowercase. About 15 seconds later, the server dropped. Number 2 Back when I was a freshman in high school, I had a MySpace page. One evening I got a friend request from some hot chick. She messaged me, and after a little bit of talking, she suggests that we trade nudes. Being a stupid 14 year old, I thought, fuck yeah, this is going to be awesome. So I take a few pics of myself and she sends me some nudes of her own. Things are going great. Out of nowhere I get a message on AIM from someone I don't know, basically saying, hey, I have those naked pictures of you. If you don't talk to me, I'm going to send them to everyone on your friends list. I start freaking out. I have no idea what to do. So I just start talking to him. At first, he tried saying he was a guy from my high school, a senior. He demanded that I get on my computer every night at 9pm and talk to him, 
or else he was going to show everyone my naked pictures. This goes on for a few weeks, and things start getting progressively worse. By now, I know he's not from my high school. He's an adult, and a complete psycho. One night I was at a friend's house, and the only person at home was my sister. She calls me and says that some guy called the house, and insisted on talking to me, and got very angry when she said that I wasn't home. A few nights later, I was not able to get on the AIM until midnight, and the first thing that he messages me when I sign on is, I've been sitting in front of your house, admiring your Winnie the Pooh flag, and trying to look into your bedroom window. I freaked the fuck out. My mum always puts up seasonal flags, and so we had some cheesy Winnie the Pooh Valentine's Day flag out on my front door. Up until this point, I hadn't told anyone about this guy. I was just hoping he'd go away. So I wake up my brother and tell him what's going on. He insists that we call the police, but I was convinced I could get him to stop bothering me and the police weren't necessary. So he goes and wakes up my parents and I tell them exactly what's been going on. My mum immediately freaks out, rightly so, and calls the police. The police come and I talk to them for a little bit, show them some of the messages that he would send me and they made a report of it. From that night on, I just completely ignored him and accepted the fact that the world was going to see me naked. I got several messages over the next few months from girls who would randomly message me my pictures. I was super embarrassed and dreaded going to school. The guy would tell everyone that I sent the pictures to him and that I was gay, etc, etc. At that age, that sort of thing can really fuck with you. Fast forward to my senior year of high school and all of this had blown over. I did a good job forgetting how this guy tormented me, and things were really going well for me. Until one night at a football game. I'm walking into the concession stand with a group of people, and a random man comes up to me and says, Somebody wants to talk to you, under the bleachers. My heart goes into my chest, and I immediately say I don't want to talk to anyone. Keep in mind, this was almost four years after the incident, but it was always in the back of my mind that he would come looking for me one day, and I knew it was him. Even though I'd never met him, I could just tell by the way that he asked that it was him. Everyone asks me what that was about, and I give them a quick rundown on who I think that was. We all head back into the stands, and another friend of mine comes running up to me and says, Hey, this weird guy is standing in the bathroom showing people naked pictures of you. We're sitting next to a teacher of mine who overhears this, and he immediately calls the police and runs over to the bathroom to try and catch the guy. The guy had already left, but I gave a description of him to the police, and some concerned parents saw what he was driving when he left. I didn't sleep at all for the next few days. I was absolutely terrified this guy would come to my house looking for me. I couldn't believe this fucking weirdo was still after me. But after a few months, nothing else happened, and I began to forget about him. At the end of school one afternoon in the spring of my senior year, I get called into the dean's office. There are several police officers and a detective. They tell me they've caught the guy that's been harassing me, and that he's been doing similar stuff to other kids at the school for quite some time. He'd been in jail before for sexual assault against a minor, and a laundry list of other crimes. The cops found literally gigabytes of child pornography on his computer, as well as tons of evidence of his obsession with me. After a lengthy trial, he's now locked up until 2037, and hopefully out of my life forever. Number 1 To begin, I think I should explain to some readers the difference between the deep web and the dark web. The deep web is a place that is accessible online by the use of special web browsers such as Tor that contains less than legal things such as drugs, human trafficking and hitmen for hire. The dark web is pretty much everything that is no longer available by conventional means, such as military websites and other sites that have not been incorporated into the current internet architecture. With that in mind, I would like to convey to you all my story of my accidental journey into the unknown space known as the dark web. I'm a computer technician by profession, 
I work for a company that is contracted by local businesses and private consumers to set up internet connections, install software, and repair any sort of computer problems that may come up. So naturally, I get all kinds of crazy stories and problems that these people can come up with. I swear some of these people just don't know how to work a computer, even in this day and age. Anyway, one day I get a call from a local business complaining that their internet is acting up and that they must have a virus. So I shake my head thinking that someone must have unplugged a network cable or downloaded a Trojan horse accidentally. As soon as I arrive, the man who called me immediately spots me and starts going on and on about hackers and how much he hates Microsoft Windows and how many viruses it creates and all that nonsense that I usually receive when addressing business problems. He leads me to his computer and I pull out my laptop and sit down in front of it and begin to work. He tells me, good luck, and walks away to do whatever it is he does in his downtime. I open up the browser he uses, and to no surprise, it opens to a, a blank page. He doesn't even have a home page at this stage. So I try connecting to google.com, and there's a 404 error. Alright, well, I know that google.com definitely exists, so there's a problem with this internet connection. I open his network and sharing center to see if I can use the built-in troubleshooter to diagnose the problem but I give myself a well-deserved facepalm when I see that he isn't connected to any network at all. So I search for networks and find a few wireless connections for him to connect to. They're all WEP encrypted and I'm almost positive that he doesn't know the key. So I break out my laptop and run a WEP cracking tool to get his computer up and running again. As I'm waiting for my tool to find the WEP key, another network suddenly shows up on my computer. This one unprotected with an SSID consisting of a random hexadecimal string. Now, I'm extremely bored waiting for this guy to return, so I decide to connect to it and take a little look around to see where this was coming from. I connect without problems and open up my toolkit of cracking tools to see if I can find the source for this connection. As I'm having fun, hacking away at this unprotected network, my computer freezes up albeit only for a second or two. But this doesn't happen much and it caught me by surprise. I shrugged it off as the poor internet speed and kept on going. A couple of minutes later, however, it happened again. And a few minutes after that, once again. Each time getting longer and longer. Weird, I thought to myself. What's with this network? It was then that things started getting really interesting. After the long string of pauses, my screen flickered a little bit, and out of nowhere, my browser opened by itself. Now I was worried that I had somehow infected my computer with some kind of malware by connecting to this network, and I proceeded to close the browser and began to disconnect from the network before anything worse could happen. But I couldn't disconnect. No matter how many times I clicked the little disconnect button, my computer didn't respond, despite everything else on my screen running fine. Shit, I thought to myself, this is going to be a long day. And just as I was about to hit the power button on my laptop to perform a hard reset, my browser opened again, this time with a little chat box opened. Hello? I stared at the screen for a couple of seconds, not quite knowing what was going on. I want to talk to you. Now... I heard about these AI programs that have all these program responses to simulate conversation with people, and I was not impressed. This was one nasty virus. You need to leave this network now. This is your last warning. Hmm, maybe an automated security program designed to keep hackers out. I'll have to admit, I was impressed with it. I had never seen anything like this before. I'm telling you one last time. Leave now. I don't know what made me do it, but I responded to the program, or what. The next response scared me more than anything in this world ever has. The program began listing information about me. My name, address, telephone number, credit card information, my parents' names, their addresses. My heart sank in my chest and all the color immediately left my face. I couldn't move. I just sat there, paralyzed with fear, but what came next was even worse. 
don't look at me like that. My webcam was on. You really shouldn't stare, H3Man4694. You might see something you regret. Suddenly, the most horrifying images you could ever imagine flashed on my screen. Images of disemboweled humans, human sacrifice, detached limbs, cannibals eating people, video clips of mass suicides and firing lines. My heart was racing, my body was shaking in utter fear of the images I was being shown. They seared into my brain. These were things that no one should ever see. I mustered the strength I had left and hit the power button on my computer and slammed it shut. I ran to the bathroom and threw up a couple of times. I was drenched in sweat. I could barely compose myself. It took me about 20 minutes to go back to my computer, and even then I had a hard time getting near it. I looked over at my client's computer and it was connected to the wireless network I was cracking earlier. It was working fine now. Just then, my client returned and thanked me for fixing his internet. I didn't say anything. I just grabbed my laptop and left. G'day mates. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed the content. I just wanted to let you guys know that I'll be doing a Q&A sometime in the near future, so if you'd like to begin sending your questions in now, I'll begin jotting them down for the video.